So our first speaker is Travis Kinney. He's the engineer for major bridge maintenance at the Oregon Department of Transportation. Travis is responsible for the major bridge maintenance program and the approximately 200 projects that it funds each year. And Travis is very interested in working directly with the bridge crews to provide structural design support. So Travis. So my name is Travis Kinney. Uh, thanks for the introduction, George. I uh, work with uh, Oregon DOT uh, for the last six years and spent the last four of those as the uh, bridge maintenance engineer. Uh, today we'll talk a little bit about Oregon's approach to timber pile repairs. So first we'll go through a little bit of the, uh, the background on our inventory, right? Why do we care about timber piles? Um, uh, I'll go through the previous repair standard. We've been repairing these for a long time, far before this new, uh, this new splice detail came out. Um, I'll run you through uh, uh, some pictures of actual field installation of the, uh, of the repair, and then uh, go through some uh, destructive testing of uh, how we validated the, uh, the design. So, uh, so Oregon's timber pile inventory. We have a lot of timber in Oregon. Uh, the timber industry was big in the 50s and 60s. We still, uh, we had built an awful lot of bridges on timber substructures, and uh, unfortunately a lot of those are still with us. Uh, we have 874 bridges with exposed timber piling. Uh, 296 of those are state owned and 578 are local agency. Uh, most of these were built between the 50s and the 80s, but the range actually goes all the way back to 1906 to 1996. I did actually just double check on that 1906 bridge. It's in Eastern Oregon, a very benign environment, and those piles are still actually performing adequately. Uh, uh, local agency bridges account for the majority of these built in the 70s and 80s. Uh, this is a graph here that shows a, uh, uh, a breakdown of the year of construction and the number of bridges. You can see that the 50s and 60s were a pretty big spike, and then those, uh, the spike in the 70s and 80s are pretty much all local agency bridges. The state kind of got out of the timber substructure game by then. Uh, I like this graph a little bit better. It shows the actual number of timber piles versus the year built. This is uh, what I consider to be my backlog of work or things that are coming up at some point. You can see from the 50s and 60s, we have thousands of piles that are still uh, in use uh, uh, on the system. So, uh, so our annual repair cost. So over the last five years, just for a snapshot, right? we've been doing this for longer, but I didn't want to go back too far in the data. Uh, we've had 100 major bridge maintenance projects on timber repairs at a total cost of around 4.3 million. So it accounts for approximately 10% of our, of our actual funding budget for timber repairs. Uh, now I'd like to show an example of a bridge that's kind of near and dear to my heart. I've actually in the last two years uh, designed three repairs on this bridge, and so it's uh, one that comes up quite frequently <laughs> every time these inspectors go out. So this is the South, South Yamhill Bridge. It's built in uh, 1951. It's located in the Willamette Valley, which is a very wet location. Uh, it has a reinforced concrete deck girder on timber pile trestles. It's, uh, it's actually a fairly large bridge. It's uh, almost 1,000 feet in length supported on 34 timber bents, and it had uh, 204 timber piles uh, supporting it originally. Uh, and the cost of replacing this bridge is $35 million. So this is part of our problem, is that this is kind of a low volume, um, uh, kind of a, a low importance bridge as far as that goes, and the cost of replacement is huge. So this is one that we are trying to work on getting replaced because of the maintenance issues, but it has trouble competing against uh, bridges on higher volume roads. So where we're at on this bridge right now is 85 of the original 204 piles have been uh, repaired with steel. You can see in the picture there, the interior four piles at that one bent have all been replaced. Um, we're just waiting for the other 119 to degrade to the point where it's time to go ahead and repair them. Uh, I call this our replacing a bridge one piece at a time method. <laughs> uh, so the, the splices that you saw on that previous drawing was our, our old detail. Um, it's a very good standard detail. It was uh, basically you would cut the timber pile off at a, at a section with 100% solid timber. You would go ahead and put a new steel H pile full height, and then you would do a reinforced concrete cage to tie the two together. Uh, the cage itself, or the steel uh, splice, or sorry, the reinforced concrete splice is uh, 30 inches in diameter and four feet in length. So it's a fairly stout splice. 
Uh, this is a drawing from it. It was uh, this was put together in 1983. I suspect we were doing these uh, kind of a, a similar splice before that. This is just the oldest actual standard that I was able to find. Uh, I love this picture because it's rare that you get to see that whole four foot splice out in the air. Uh, so this one, uh, it did rot right below that splice location, and so we did do a project to go ahead and repair it. Um, but you can see some of the issues that they would have had with this is that, uh, uh, one, just keeping that reinforced concrete cage aligned and uh, in the right location would have been a challenge. So some of the drawbacks of the old splice detail. It was really difficult to install in uh, tight spaces, so particularly at abutments, but we also have a lot of these, you know, these are small bridges, so some of them only have four feet of clearance even at the interior bends. So that's tough digging, tough work. Uh, the uh, required excavation had to continue at least two feet deeper than the rot, right? We said a four foot splice, and so wherever your rot stopped, you had to go at least two feet below that. Uh, so for a typical excavation where the rot only went two feet into the ground, uh, which is what you hoped for, then you dug another two feet, you ended up with two and a half uh, cubic yards of material being removed. Uh, and if the rot extended more than two feet down, which does happen, uh, now you're into a greater than a four foot excavation, and so now you're either having to bench your uh, supports or you're having to uh, uh, provide some sort of a shoring. And uh, so that splice is 18 cubic feet of concrete, which isn't really enough to get a ready mix supplier excited, but it's awful lot of hand mixing, and it weighs about 2,700 pounds. Uh, the other complaint that I heard about it was that the seal cage was difficult to deal with. So what they would do is they'd build the seal cage and slide it up the seal pile prior to making the splice, and they would kind of tie it up and, and fasten it up to keep it out of their way while they did some of the lower splice details. So this is kind of an example of one spot. If you're at an abutment, there's no way you're getting a four-foot concrete splice in there. It's, at least not without a, a very large excavation where you could start undermining your, uh, your abutment. So, so I was talking to the bridge crews and they said, you know, we really want you to come up with something else. And so this is kind of our wish list. We, they wanted to get rid of the reinforced concrete splice. Uh, they wanted to see if they could make the splice link smaller. Uh, they really wanted to reduce the depth of excavation. They said, do you really have to splice it at 100% solid section? What if it's only got three inches of rot at that spot? Is that okay? Could we, could we make some kind of a, a compromise there? And the last one is, is they really like to use the hydraulic jacks, and so they requested that when you preload the pile, you get rid of the screw, the screw jack detail that was done before and give them an actual hydraulic jack to, to do the loading. So we worked with the guys and I came up with a, a, a or we, I should say we came up with a plan to, uh, to replace the concrete collar with an oversized seal pipe pile that you would then grout together. We said, well, let's go ahead and, and reason this through that we can splice at a location with less than 100% timber section, or solid timber section. Uh, we're gonna then have them basically do a, 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 like a cavity fill. They're gonna auger out the rot that still is in the ground below that and fill that void space with a high early strength concrete. Uh, and then they're gonna, on top of that, they're gonna splice to a steel pile or steel square tubing uh, that they're gonna preload with a hydraulic jack. So I know that's kind of difficult to visualize, so we're gonna go ahead and run through kind of the steps of it. Uh, uh, the crew is kind enough to provide it. This is that same uh, South Yam Hill Bridge. You can see one of the difficulties with it is the fact that those uh, piles are actually quite tall. Those are, those are big bends. You have a lot of longitudinal and transverse uh, shoring or uh, uh, bracing. So step one, um, we do provide stamped uh, and designed jacking and repair plans for all of our pile repairs. So for this particular one, they needed to install some temporary shoring, so you can see that they're installing that there. Step two is excavate at least two feet below ground level. We always want the, the, the bottom of that new steel splice to be at least two feet below ground level. The hope is, is that at two foot of depth that you've limited the oxygen enough so that the rot won't reinitiate below the splice. So from there, they're gonna go ahead and cut out the, uh, the rotted portion of the timber pile and then they'll go and uh, core down with uh, augers or whatever means they need to to remove the rest of the rot. So sometimes this actually extends quite deep and they'll get uh, extensions for the augers and continue down in that fashion. Uh, but in general, you're usually talking two, three feet, kind of that range. Uh, once it's all cleaned out, it'll look something like this. We do have them uh, kind of, uh, so the two feet is what we're hoping to keep the rot from reinitiating. 
We also require that the guys uh, uh, drill a small hole at the base of that, uh, of the center of that pile, and install a borat rod. It's uh, when the moisture content gets above 28%, you start to have rot reinitiate. It diffuses boron into the pile and should keep the rot from continuing. So then they come out and they fill the cavity that, that or they set the seal pile over it. It's about a two foot section. Uh, and then they go ahead and they fill the interior of the timber pile that they just augured out. And then that void space between the timber and the steel with a, a high early strength grout. Doesn't necessarily have to be high early strength, but these are always done under some sort of a traffic restriction. And so you want the high early strength just so that you can get your compressive strength high enough, quick enough to get traffic back onto the bridge. Uh, and you can see this is a far smaller mix than the two and a half cubic yards of, uh, of, the, uh, well, of the, uh, the previous concrete repair. So once they have the, the grout on the inside filled up, then they're gonna put a steel uh, bearing plate on top of the, uh, the steel pile. Uh, and weld that in the field. You can see there's two holes there at the, uh, the center of the pile. That's uh, grout vents for them to complete the pour. That last pour, they left it a little bit short of the top so that they could uh, 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 get a nice clean weld on this. So here's uh, uh, what it looks like once they've uh, used those grout vents and filled it all the way up to the top. Now you've completely uh, contained the previous timber pile and capped it, uh, and you should have good bearing through that. Uh, in this uh, section here, what they've done is they've installed the uh, steel tubing above it. And you can see the hydraulic jack down there at the base. That's where they're preloading it. As part of our design plans, we do give them a, uh, uh, a target loading value, something like we'll tell them 2,400 PSI for a 20-ton jack, something in that range, uh, so that they know what to preload it. Just trying to get the service level dead load back into the pile. So from there, we need to... Uh, we're gonna to have to remove that jack at some point, so now we need to go ahead and install some steel shims. Uh, once the jack's loaded, they'll field measure the height of uh, the, the remaining gap there, and they'll cut uh, steel channels uh, to the right size, and they'll go ahead and weld those into place. And then this is what this one looks like when it's all said and done. The only thing that's kind of unique about this particular uh, pile repair is that the bents were so tall and the bridge is being considered for replacement that we didn't feel like it was necessary to uh, continue that new steel pile full height. It would require an awful lot of extra work and shoring to be able to get that into place. And so that top splice is basically the same thing that I just mentioned, only it was at a section with 100% good timber and uh, they just turned the can upside down and then grouted that into place. Um, and so if you look at the, uh, that, that lower splice location where the jack used to be, I'll show you a cross section of what that would look like. It's kind of hard to see from that picture. So what you have is you have two channels on the outside, and those are the ones that you get the dead load back into, you weld them. Once you're done, then there's room to pull that jack out from the middle of them. And then you're gonna weld up two 3 8 inch plates to go ahead and basically reform that box to make it continuous. So an awful lot of field welding. Uh, I know that a lot of people are less comfortable with that. Our crews do a good job and they do maintain all their welding certifications. And to be honest, they really like to field weld. So, so this was what our plan was. The question was is, how much rot's too much rot, right? I'm a, I'm a young engineer, I still have student loans. I need to make sure that everything here is on the up and up, right? You gotta make sure you can pay those back. And so we started wondering, you know, how do you quantify that, right? I can reasonably, I can think my way through this and say that this repair should work well, but there you have a steel, concrete, and timber all in the same cross section. How are they interacting? So we decided to go ahead and, and break some. So we contracted with Oregon State University to uh, destructively test six piles for us. Uh, we did three in lateral loading and three in compression, and uh, we simulated different depths of rot. And so we went 21 inches, 35 inches, and then uh, just over four feet for the last one. And so we really got fairly aggressive with how deep did that rot continue past the, the cut line. Um, all the piles were augured out to a two inch shell. We decided that that would be our kind of our minimum. At a two inch shell, that's usually when our piles hit our, our radar as being an urgent priority. And so at that point, uh, you're, we, we wanna at least maintain that two inch uh, uh, solid timber shell on the outside of the piles. So in this detail here, you can see the, uh, the hatched area is kind of the perspective of how deep that rock goes. So the next step was to find some piles. Um, so we did have a stockpile of ones that had been previously removed from service. 
um, largely due to checking issues, but there was some rot in them already. Um, we really didn't want to go and buy brand new timber piles because we're not doing these repairs on brand new timber piles. We're doing them on things that uh, have been in the field for a long time. Uh, so these ones, like I said, were removed. So then the question becomes, so the ones that weren't rotted all the way, we wanted to get that rot four feet deep, right? So when you ask a carpenter or anyone else, you know, how do you take the interior 10 inches out of a 14 inch pile, they'll look at you funny. <laughs> I had quite a few of them do that. And so I worked with the bridge crew and these guys were great during it. They did a lot of trial and error figuring out how on earth do we get all that out? Because this isn't rotted material that comes out quite easily, it's more of a solid material. So we got really big augers and they started, started to work. And when the augers weren't big enough, they got a pole saw and they continued to work with that. And so like I said, the guys worked really hard on getting these piles fabricated uh, and set up. And just there is kind of a perspective to see just how deep that really went. And so this is similar to the previous slide, and that's what it looks like when they were kind of done. So for the compression test, um, they were about eight foot in length, and what we're really trying to test here is the cross-sectional capacity of that splice. Um, we kind of predicted that the failure mode would be as you get that kind of unconfined timber shell with a concrete core, but that would kind of buckle outward at some point, or that that concrete plug would kind of bust its way through. Um, uh, in general, the, the piles that I've looked at, they're considered short columns. Buckling does not drive the, uh, the capacity of them. They're fairly stout and short. And so that's why we're looking at the cross-sectional capacity, really. So here's our test setup. That's a Milo from Oregon State, and he does the testing there. Um, so this is for the axial test. Uh, that's the loading actuator on the end, uh, 150 ton uh, ram. And then uh, you can see the, uh, the white line on that timber pile. That shows where that, that simulated rot stopped. So you have a pretty good section of unconfined uh, uh, concrete, or, or that's just being confined by the timber. And you can see, here's kind of a close-up picture of it. You can see, uh, like I said, we did pull piles from service, so you can see some, there's pretty good checking in some of those piles. They would not be ones you'd consider to be uh, pristine by any means. We, we didn't try and selectively find the good ones. We, we really wanted what's the, some of the junk out there. What, what are we actually repairing? So same with this one, you can see there's a, a kind of a hunk uh, gouged out of the, the side of that one. Could have been during removal. Some of these, uh, uh, when they were being removed, they weren't intending them to be uh, set up for a test later. They were just in the yard and had been removed. So, so some of that could have been there. So when you hire someone to break something, it's a good idea to check and see how big their jacks are. So uh, what we found on our compression test is that all three of the piles we tried, we could not fail any of them. The, uh, they, we reached the limit of the, uh, the jack at 300,000 pounds, far higher than what the design loading would be of these piles. Typically for uh, strength two, you're talking in the range of maybe 40,000 pounds, and so you're way, way higher. But it did make for a, kind of an awkward moment when they go, so is that okay? I go, well, I hired you to break them. <laughs> so like, well, we can't. So, anyways, it was a successful test. I was looking, I was hoping for a, a video of, of the actual destruction. That would have been fun to, to be able to show, but uh, we just simply didn't get there. Um, we didn't find that the concrete plug uh, made a difference in the loading. Uh, we thought with that four feet that we really would have found kind of our outer range of it, uh, but it, it just, we just couldn't quite fail them. So, for the lateral testing, we had to switch the setup a little bit and make the piles quite a bit longer. Um, again, you can see there's pretty good checking in the pile. We, we didn't go and cherry pick. Um, and then here's the other view of that, uh, the lateral test setup. So really kind of testing that splice and bending. And so you can see here that the, uh, the seal pile is a bit stiffer than the timber pile. And so this is a kind of a typical failure mode that we saw from this. Uh, you'd kind of have a, uh, a failure right at the base of the splice location. Um, one thing that we, we did notice is that it uh, it was always a very ductile failure. The load actually never really dropped off. They kept pulling and then resetting the chain and pulling further and resetting the chain and pulling further. And uh, the load just kind of plateaued uh, at around uh, 12,000 pounds of lateral load, uh, which is like 110, 120 uh, kit feet for a moment. We did have one pile that was quite a bit lower. Um, we didn't test enough for a real significant, or to make it a statistical significance. Um, but the, uh, when we ran through the numbers, we found out that the failure loading was kind of fairly similar to what you'd expect a two-inch solid timber shell to give you. 
right? Uh, 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 a timber shell has still quite a bit of its capacity left, just the way that it rots. Leave that solid ring around the outside. It's an efficient tube section. Um, and so at, at that point, you still have quite a bit of the lateral capacity, but you have certainly lost some. And so that's what we're recommending is that you, uh, you analyze it based on uh, a two inch shell and see if you need to add some additional lateral supports on that. Um, so in conclusion, the, uh, the proposed pile repair can be used to fully restore the axial column for short columns, uh, or the axial capacity for short columns. The, uh, the lateral demand and remaining capacity should be evaluated as part of the repair plan. Uh, and if you need to provide some additional lateral, lateral support, or if the rot's not particularly deep, then maybe you just go ahead and have them do the splice at 100% solid section. We still would have the benefit of having quite a bit smaller uh, uh, splice length. The splice length that was done during the test was about 18 inches. In the field, we recommend two feet just to make sure that that can is always two feet below ground level. Um, uh, just in general, uh, one of these pile repairs takes one of our crews a little less than a day, um, this, barring any kind of extravagant shoring that's required. Uh, cost of the repair is between four and five thousand dollars. So, so that's it. Thanks, guys. So we have just a couple of minutes for questions, and I, I have got kind of a trivial one. Well, how recently did you develop the, the compact newer splice, and how many have you installed so far? So, uh, so we started installing them about a year ago, and we've installed maybe 15 to 20 of them so far. And any, uh, w with the experience of 15 to 20, would you change the detail at all? The detail has been modified as we go throughout. The crews have little things that uh, originally the, uh, the jacking location was at the top of the piles thinking that you'd have a nice firm base at, at the top and that's where you would preload it. The guys didn't like that. They preferred to actually load it down below. Other questions for Travis? Yeah. Steve. Hey, Travis. Uh, Steve, uh, how did you select the uh, simulation of 21 inch, 35 inch? Odd, odd numbers, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I actually had that in there and I took it out. I didn't think anyone would call me on it. So it was 1.5 pile diameters, 2.5 pile diameters, and 3.5 pile diameters, right? Being a geek, I just couldn't pick a nice round number. <laughs> uh, any others? Okay, well, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks.